Aloha, everyone. I'm Richard Emery, one of the hosts for Condo Insider on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we're going to have an exciting show talking about one of my favorite topics, dispute resolution. But before I do that, I do want to give you a little one minute update on the legislature for 2021. Uh, as you know, we started out with about 30 bills. We're down to about seven left. Uh, most of them have been defeated, uh, particularly the ones that the industry thought were. Uh, not in our favor. And um, we'll address this a little bit today in, the, in some of my topics on dispute resolution, because uh, when they passed the changes to the law on dispute resolution last year, 2020, uh, those two laws deleted the sunset date on some of the things I'm talking about. So everything I'm talking about is current and valid. And you're looking at the old law and it talks about a sunset date. They no longer exist in the process here. But let me tell you, as I think you all know, I do a lot of expert witness work on litigation in the industry. Let me tell you why this is particularly important dispute resolution with owners and, and others, because that's gonna affect your pocketbook. I'm an expert on a case where in fact, that particular association had numerous claims by owners against it for minor things in some cases, more significant than other, but they had a lot of claims. In this particular association, prior to uh, these claims, uh, were paying about $2,700 a year in their director and officer liability insurance. Well, they had so many claims that the insurance company declined to renew the policy forcing the association to go to the standard market, you know, the, not the standard market, the uh, outside the standard market. And their premiums went from $2,700 a year to $29,000 a year. So you can imagine what a $22,000 a year increase does to the maintenance fee. You know, it, depending on the size of your association, if in fact you were 100 units, that's $2,200 uh, a, a unit. And it can raise the maintenance fees $150 a month. So if you don't look at disputes with homeowners seriously and look at the options you have, many of them don't cost you any money, that you in fact are putting yourself in risk because Hawaii has one of the highest director and officer liability claims ratios in the United States, if not the highest. In fact, it's been difficult to get insurance carriers to continue to write DNO insurance, even though it's required by statute. And so you have all these off-market insurance companies coming in, and maybe you're willing to pay $29,000 a year for insurance. But it's going to only get worse if we don't find ways to resolve problems among ourselves within our community. So. Let's get kind of right into some of the meat of that. Now, I'm gonna talk about another case that uh, I was involved in. It didn't result in litigation or claim, but it's kind of the poster child for what goes wrong. And, and owners wanted to see a copy of a contract that the association recently entered into. And the association immediately said, I'm sorry, that's private business. We're not going to give it to you. Ignoring the fact that the condo statute says the owners are entitled to all contracts. So then what the uh, board said when they learned that they were wrong, that they had to give that to them, they said, well, we're not going to give it to you until you give us a notarized statement that you're only going to use it for yourself. That's an interesting thing because the statute does provide you can ask for a notarized statement. But as soon as you do that, you're sending a message to the owner, we have something to hide. If it's so simple as a copy of the contract and you know they're going to get it anyway, why would you throw all these roadblocks? Why wouldn't you just say, close with a copy of the contract or a close with a copy of the minutes you requested? If you're in litigation with them and the, and the issues are more complex, I can understand the notarized statement. But what kind of message are you really being transparent as a board? If in fact they hadn't learned of their obligations and accepted the managing agent's advice 
they could have had another claim because as soon as the claim was submitted for mediation or lawsuit, uh, the managing agent turns into the insurance agent who gives it to the insurance company who appoints a defense, which rises your claim, claim ratio. And so I implore all of you to use some common sense that you are elected officials of your members and barring some extraordinary circumstance, what you wanna do is be transparent and make it somewhat easy for owners to get the things that they're entitled to by law. I can tell you clearly from example, there's been owners who say things that they are not entitled to. For example, I've had owners come to me and say, I want a copy of the bank statement. Well, that may have electronic information, certainly your account number on it, and you would want to redact that information, but the law doesn't require you to give them the bank statement. I've even had owners come to me and say, I want the signature cards when you open the bank account. Well, the law doesn't say you have to give the signature cards, and certainly the signatures in this world of scanning and duplicating and fraud, probably not a good idea to give the signature cards. So you can have people who are asking for unreasonable things, but if in fact an owner is asking for something they're entitled to under the statute, or something there's no harm to the association, why not just make it easy and give it to them and avoid the claim? And if you're in a dispute over what they can have or not have, why not invite them to a board meeting and talk to them and treat them as adults uh, and not with a traffic cop mentality, as I call it, and, and, and try to talk through it with them before it becomes a claim. And believe me, I've been in this business 26 years. I understand that there are people out there, no matter what you say, are going to have an adverse view and, and still cause trouble. But if we can minimize the total number of claims, it's going to affect your pocketbook. The first thing I want to just remind you of is that associations are based on the principle of self-governance. You look at the approximately 1,800 associations in the state of Hawaii, and you look at the, some are agricultural, some are senior living, some are residential, some are high-rise, some are low-rise. None of these governing documents are the same. And the issues within that association will vary quite a bit particularly based on uh, the age of the project. Uh, older projects have more maintenance issues than newer projects do, typically. Not always true, but typically. So the legislature, in putting together all the laws with regard to that, rely on self-governance by a board based on the governing documents of the association. And so I have another case I'm aware of where an owner... Uh, the board has some issues with the decks leaking and the, the shape of the condo makes the deck, the roof of the guy below it's, and it's shaped like stairs. So the, they have leaky decks. And so the board went through and they got uh, an engineer and we got um, uh, manufacturers to come out and inspect the property. And the board came out with an affordable economic solution, no assessment, all to be paid for by reserves. However, one owner said, I don't like the solution. And so I'm not going to do it, even though everybody else is going to do it. And he said, I'm going to do my own solution. And uh, I'll just indemnify the board. Well, you know, the, if the roof leaks, it doesn't affect him. It affects the guy below him. So the board has said, no, 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 no. We have the authority. We made the decision. And you have to do it. And, and that person, owner said no and filed a lawsuit saying we don't have to do it. Well, you know, it's still in litigation, so I don't know the results, although I know that uh, he made a summary judgment to say that their interpretation of the governing documents is right, not, not the board's interpretation nor its attorney's interpretation. And the judge threw the summary judgment out. And then there were other things we requested from that owner, refused to comply. and. And they meanwhile got a judgment against them for all the legal fees and costs to date on certain aspects of the case because they didn't want to disclose their strategy and what they had and why they felt their product was better than the board's product. To me, this is nuts. You know, if you have a board that's elected and they've got architects and engineers and lawyers and they're saying this is the fix, then in fact, you kind of have to go along with it because the association is paying for it out of reserves. In this case, no special assessment. They had the money. And if there's a problem, who's to be responsible? The board. 
you do your own thing, you're not going to be protected by that. But it goes back to self-governance. Most judges rely on the fact that they depend on the boards to do what's proper and right in this case. And what's interesting uh, in that particular association, they just had an annual meeting and this came up and the owners, we had um, um, approximately uh, 80% or 82% there and by quorum. 18% didn't send in proxies to do anything. So they made a motion to affirm the board's decision to do this product and this fix. And the, the vote was 100% in favor of the fix the board selected, except for one owner. I bet you can guess which one that was. So, but the problem is that all this lawsuit, all this stuff is being defended at great cost by the insurance company, who I'm sure will take it into consideration when their when their when their um, premiums come up next year. I could, don't know that, but I would suspect it from experience. So the question is, why can't people sit down and talk? And it's, I'm going to tell you right now, not everybody's going to agree, and people get hard head. But the reality of it is, too many times I see boards treat that like we're elected, you're just an owner, and we're not going to deal with you. And yeah, sometimes they're a pain in the coli, but you've been elected to deal with the pain in the coli besides the wonderful, upstanding, always correct, right people like me, who never makes a mistake. Last mistake I made was 1972, I think. My wife pointed that out. Only joking, of course. But let's look at what the options are after the break. I'm going to take you through the free options you have. If you can't get it done among yourselves, the free options you have to deal with disputes. So we're going to be right back after the break. Aloha, Richard Emery, your host today on Condo Insider, talking about dispute resolution. And I first half was lecturing everybody about, come on, can't we all get along together, you know? And can't we talk and try to explain this without it becoming combative? And I explained to you the risk of the insurance. So let's talk about what your options are. And I'm going to deal with a couple of them very quickly because. They're very rarely used anymore, but they're in the statute. <clears throat> One of them is what we call facilitative mediation, where you can go for 50 bucks a person and have a mediator try to help you resolve the dispute. Usually it's an attorney or trained professional. The problem with that is under facilitative mediation, the rules are mediator can't take a position and so I was trying to get two hard heads to agree and they never agree. And, and so you try the mediation and, and it, it didn't work. The second is called non-binding arbitration. Now that's kind of a paradox of words because everybody looks at arbitration as usually binding instead of going to court. But what happens in non-binding arbitration under the statute, which is under our condo statute, you can have all the rules of arbitration, go and get a buy opinion, but if either side doesn't like their written opinion at the end of all this and spending all this money and all these rules of conduct, like a court case, if one side doesn't like it, you've got to go back to square one. And certainly there's some rules that if you don't prevail by a certain percentage and the next time around, you may be liable for the other side's legal fees. But it's kind of like, why spend all the money to do this 
if you aren't going to get a final resolution to it. So let me say the third thing, which is the last option, would be litigation. Sue and spend all the money with attorneys. But let me tell you the two things you can do that are affordable, they should work, they provide solutions, and they get fast results. The first one I already told you about. Have your own talk story session, executive session with the, with the owner and try to resolve it in some reasonable way. And I would tell you probably half the cases I see should be able to resolve if you just treat people with respect and talk story with them and accept your duty and responsibility as a board member to um, do this. Well, the other one, which is very popular, has a very high success rate, is called evaluative mediation. It's new under the statute, Act 196. As I told you earlier, if you read it and saw a sunset date of June 30th last year, that was removed by the legislature. So if you don't have the most current copy of 514B, you might get confused. But evaluative mediation is highly successful. And you know what evaluative mediation is? You go to one of the couple of agencies approved for this, and they have retired judges. And under evaluative mediation, that retired judge can take the gloves off and tell you what he really thinks. His job is like a settlement conference judge to drive you to a solution. So he's not embarrassed to say to an owner, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If I was a judge, I'd make you pay all his legal fees. You're not going to win this matter. Or we can say to the board, you better give him the contract. The statute says, and if you don't give him the contract and I was a judge, I'd make you pay all his legal fees. So the, these judges are very, very adept at driving solutions and settlement, recognizing, again, if you have hard heads, there may not, or if it's unreasonable what they're asking for, they may not be able to get it. So how do you get evaluative mediation? Well, you go to uh, the real estate website, they'll give you the name of the providers who offer it, but the number one provider in Honolulu is Dispute, Dispute Prevention Resolution Inc., DPR it's called. And they have a huge group of retired judges. And they do other things besides condo work, obviously. And what they'll do is you fill out a page it's about the size of one side of an eight and a half, 11 sheet of paper. And you say, I want to have resolution on this matter. You put your name, the association, what your matter is, and you sign it. And then you know what they do is they contact the board, who is managing agent, and say, we have a mediation request. Under the condo statute, it's a breach of fiduciary duty for the board not to go to this mediation. So if, in fact, they wouldn't go, you can file in court to make them go, and you'd be entitled by statute to get your legal fees back. But you know what? Everybody goes because all the lawyers tell them, if you don't go, this is what's going to happen. So what happens is you file your, your, your demand. DPR, in this case, goes and talks to the managing agent. It can be vice versa the managing agent or the association can file a claim against an owner. So it works both ways. And what happens in that dis dispute, they, they then go ahead and they set up uh, a mediator who every, both sides have to agree to. And then they give you a chance to put more detail and documents and writing to the mediator. But the cost for this is each side pays one half of the mediator's first hour. So if the mediator charges $350, which is typical, then in fact, each side would pay one time 175 bucks. And where does the rest of the payment come from? It comes from the real estate commission trust fund that in fact, um, you know, we pay or associations pay on the number of units into uh, a fund that has about a million and a half dollars in it to handle education and mediation. So the rest of the cost is borne by the Real Estate Education Trust Fund, which includes this mediation provision. Now, there is a cap on that. If I remember correctly, it's $9,000. But then the mediator has the right, if he's close to settlement, can go back to the Real Estate Commission and say, I would like another 5000 or 1000 or whatever it may be to wrap this up, because I'm close. So. It seems to me on, on these simple disputes that for 175 bucks each side, and if you're a board, think of it this way. Are you doing your fiduciary duty for your owners 
by avoiding thousands of dollars of legal fees or risk of increasing um, your insurance premiums because you have too many claims. You know, so it seems to me for 175 bucks, this mediation, you're not obligated to agree at the end of the day, but you have a professional, a retired judge skilled at this trying to bring a resolution to this problem. I do want to footnote this, that when the law was put in under the same program, you can agree voluntarily to make it binding arbitration if you don't want to do mediation. So you would have a binding and final result. The risk, you know, for some associations, they don't like to, the board themselves, the directors don't like to deal with this. So they want their lawyer to deal with it for them. Well, if they hire a lawyer to go to the mediation, then they have to pay the legal fees related to the lawyer, you know, with regard to this matter. So, uh, but I would tell you, I track all of this because every month the real estate commission puts out a bulletin and they list all the cases that are filed and whether they were resolved or not. And you know what happens? Close to 70, 80% are being resolved through this value of mediation. But I track it further to see how many end up in lawsuit. And you know what? I haven't found any to end up in a lawsuit because a owner who doesn't like the results and doesn't want to admit he was wrong says, you know, I have risk because the judge told me that I'm going to have to pay all his costs. I'm just going to ignore it and, and, and forget it ever happened. So as it's, 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 it's weird as that may sound, that's actually what happens. Very few of these end up in litigation after they get a skilled legal professional to try to measure this. And there are times, by the way, and you know, the most common claim I can tell you right now is on insurance proceeds and how much the associate had to pay and how much the owner had to pay in his unit, and those things. More times than not through that dialogue with the evaluative this retired judge, the mediator, a resolution is reached and a compromise is reached and an understanding is reached and the problem goes away. And so the, the kind of the message I have to all of you is, is that you as the board and you as the owner have a great deal with how this is going to affect your association as neighbors, what your costs are for director and officer liability insurance and your ability to get it. And the angst you're going to go through of not liking each other for months or years while you fight this out through some other mechanism within the law, like litigation, uh, to resolve this. I would submit to you that it's my opinion, and has always been my opinion, that the first thing to do is try to get them to an executive session and invite the owner or try to go to the board and say, I'd like to talk to you in private, all very legal, and try to resolve the matter. You know, another common mediation request I see is, is the issues of paying legal fees and late fees with regard to an interest with regard to delinquency. You know, that's not so simple anymore as far as notice requirements or whatever. And I've seen many cases settle where the owner agrees to pay the legal fees, but the association waives part of the fines. And the owner agrees that if he does it again, then all the fines are kind of put in suspense for a year. All the old fines will come back if they did it again. Same with house rule violations. So it's just ways to deal with the dispute resolution and keep yourself as a happy, harmonious community. And, and, and get through these things with, 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 with the least amount of angst as possible. But for whatever reason, I still see case after case after case filed where people uh, choose because they get real angry to go hire a lawyer and, and uh, some lawyers who want, I guess, the income and the fees file the lawsuits and you've already started down this expensive road that's hard to get out of where uh, I would hope that the boards would realize and I would hope managing agents would be saying when these things come up, you know, uh, let's talk about a value of mediation, what the choices are. There's no harm, no foul. If you don't like the results of the value of mediation, you can say to the board or an owner, well, I'm not going to agree. We're not going to do it. And then someone's got to choose whether you file a lawsuit or, or, or not, and if you file a lawsuit, it usually ends up in binding arbitration and everybody spends thousands of dollars and the, if the associations, the defendant, they turn it over to the insurance company who may not 
charge you for the lawyer. They're not going to pay for your your claims if you were wrong, if there's some kind of financial damage, but they'll pay to defend you. And so what happens at the end of the day, they look at how many claims you've had. They say, well, you know, we're not going to pay out $20,000 in, in claims and, and, and attorney's fees and only taking $2,000 in director and officer liability insurance. For some reason, if you only have one claim over a long period of time, they'll do that because the weight of the pool not having claims makes it a profitable enterprise. But we know in Hawaii that Dino insurance is not profitable today. And we're fighting the battle of heavily rising premiums. And we're fighting the battle of everybody being upset with each other and not doing it. So I guess in summary, as we get to the end of the show, our last two minutes, I would just again to remind you that under Act 186, under the current law, you have a very simple, inexpensive way to deal with disputes, even complex disputes are worth a chance to try to resolve this without having to go through the expensive issue. And for boards or owners to take their own drawn, line in the sand drawn position, it's not helpful to anybody and certainly not helpful to the community at large because uh, uh, my prediction and the predictions I've seen are that, uh, that the, the cost of insurance is gonna go up dramatically. So on that note, I'm on Princeville Kauai today. It's beautiful here. No rain, which is a blessing. And we're going to wrap up the show. And we're going to thank you for uh, joining us on Condo Insider. You're always welcome to email me if you have specific questions about this. But we're going to thank you for joining the show. We're on every Thursday at 3 p.m. trying to help the community in the association world be a better community. So thank you for joining us today. And again, I'll remind you, uh, make a donation to Think Tech Hawaii as we're all suffering after this COVID. This is a great service to our community. Aloha.